Hey y'all, today I'm going to be sharing Easter recipes. This past weekend I made an early Easter dinner for my family because on actual Easter we'll be going to another family member's house to eat and we'll also be leaving for a little mini getaway for the kids spring break so we'll be crazy busy. So I wanted to film everything, take y'all along with me in hopes to offer some inspiration and just some ideas towards your Easter menu. The first thing that I got started on was dessert. So I was originally gonna make an orange fluff salad, but I could not find orange jello mix anywhere. I went to three different stores. So I'm just substituting that with a box of strawberry jello mix. So that's one thing about living in a small town. It feels impossible to get everything that you need on your grocery list. So if I don't plan ahead of time to go a town over, I just have to make modifications and it's all right. So to that strawberry jello mix, I added in a cup of boiling water. I whisked it until it was dissolved and then I added in a half a cup of cold water and mix that together good. So here I'm just taking some cling wrap and covering that bow tightly. I set that in the fridge for 15 minutes and then I pulled it out. Um, I whipped out a box of instant vanilla pudding mix, threw that in, and I'm going to get that mixed together really good. Since I'm only making one dessert, I really wanted to make a carrot cake, but my husband's birthday is the 28th, which is tomorrow. I'll be making a cake for that, and then there will be other desserts on actual Easter, so that is a lot in a week's time. So this is the route that I chose to go with, and I'm really glad that I did. So after I got the pudding mix in, I let that sit in the fridge for another 15 minutes, pulled it out, and grabbed a container of Cool Whip. I'm going to add in the whole container and then with a spatula I'm just going to get all of that folded together. This is going to take a few minutes for it to really incorporate into it but just keep going with it. It will work out. I know that my Cool Whip it was a little bit tricky to get the lumps worked out but I got it done and then I'm going to grab my mini marshmallows and I'm going to add in two cups of those, fold those in. You can also use the little colored mini marshmallows that are fruit flavored in place of that if you want it to. I'm going to grab two cans of mandarin oranges. The first one I already had on hand. The second one is what I had available to me. I drained those off very well and I'm going to dump those in. I'm also going to grab a can of crushed pineapples and drain those as well and just fold it all together gently. I love the colors of this. It's perfect for springtime, perfect for Easter. I think it is just a beautiful dessert. It reminds me a lot of when I was a kid and all of the church potlucks that we had. There was always some type of like a fluff salad. This is a very vintage recipe. This has been around a long time and I just love that. My mom always makes a pistachio version for Easter. It's one of my favorite desserts. I also really wanted to do that, but if I can't find orange jello mix where I live, I should Sure ain't gonna come across a box of pistachio pudding so I really like this version as well and I just transferred it to this serving dish I've had this since 2013 we got it as a wedding gift if you flip it over it's a cake stand and you know if you do it this way it's either a punch bowl serving bowl I've loved it a long time and the cherries and walnuts is optional I just kind of wanted to decorate the top I know pecans is probably more traditional but I just wanted to use those walnuts up and you know the long longer it sits in the fridge, the better it's going to be. It's going to thicken up and it's just going to turn into an incredible dessert. So I just covered this with cling wrap and I let that sit in the fridge until it was dinner time. The next thing that I got started was my deviled eggs since these two taste better the longer that they sit in the refrigerator. These are a staple at every holiday meal. I feel like they truly complete the table. So I'm going to show y'all how I hard boil my eggs since that's going to be key to making perfect deviled eggs. This has been my method for several years and it is truly fail proof. They turn out perfect every single time. So I am just taking my eggs. These are just, I'm going to be doing 12. These are large eggs and I'm carefully dropping them into a big pot of boiling water and dropping them into boiling water versus cold water is going to help them peel like a dream. So I've also recently learned that if you let the eggs sit out for at least 30 minutes before you drop them into the boiling water, you should have no issues with them cracking. 
So once I get those all in there, I set a timer for 13 minutes. And once the 13 minutes is up, I'm just going to remove those from the pot and dunk them into a bowl of ice water. Um, that's also going to help it peel really easily. It's also going to help stop it cooking because you don't want the yolks to get gray or green, anything like that. So I let those sit in the ice water for five minutes. And then I wanted to show y'all how easily these eggs peel. That came off in one piece. I love it so much. So I'm just going to run that under some cold tap water to get any little tiny pieces that may be left behind. I dry those off really good on a paper towel. I gave y'all a close up of the egg yolks to just show you how perfect they are. They're perfectly cooked through. No discoloration at all. Just a bright perfect yellow. So I just cut those in half and pop the egg yolks into a small bowl and get the egg whites into my deviled egg container. So this next step is very important. This is where all your flavor is going to come from. I'm just taking the back of a fork and I'm mashing up all of those egg yolks the best that I can. You want to get it into very small crumbles and then you want to grab your favorite mayo. I like to either use Dukes or Hellman's for my deviled eggs. I have no certain measurements. I just basically finished off off the bottom of that. I typically do like two big spoonfuls, but I did a little extra this time. I do about two heaping tablespoons of mustard, I'd say. I do a splash of dill pickle juice. I feel like that's the key ingredient, ties everything together, and then just some salt and black pepper. I keep it very simple. I don't like to mess with this recipe when it comes to holidays. It's very good this way. So now I'm just getting my piping bag ready. I just have a piping bag and a tip. If you don't have those two things, you can definitely use just a Ziploc bag. You don't need the tip. Just cut it off and do it that way. Or if you don't want it to be fancy, you could even just spoon it in. It doesn't really matter. Um, but I just like to use a cup to help me. I put all of my filling in there and then I'm just bringing it up. I'm twisting the top of that bag and pushing down. And now my piping bag is ready. So I'm just going to start filling up these egg whites. I just apply a little bit of pressure and go in a circular motion. Very easy. I'm going to grab my paprika and I'm just going to go in and sprinkle a little bit over top of each egg. I feel like this makes them look really festive and it truly is just the perfect little final touch. But that is all there is to my deviled eggs. They are very simple, but everyone always loves them. They are always a huge hit and I love this deviled egg container. It was another wedding gift I've had forever. It stacks up and I'll store it in the fridge. Next, I'm going to make some homemade rolls. I have attempted this recipe once before and I failed at it, but I'm really glad that I gave it another try because these are so delicious. So to a small saucepan, I melted down two tablespoons of butter. I added in one cup of water and a half a cup of milk. And then here, I'm just adding in two tablespoons of some honey. I did spray my measuring spoon with some Pam first. That way, the honey would just slide on out easily. I have it over about a medium heat and I'm just coming in every little bit or so and whisking that together, making sure to really get the honey mixed throughout. I am not wanting this to come up to a bowl. I'm just heating it to 110 degrees. I did use a meat thermometer to help me measure that, and then I transferred it to my KitchenAid mixer. I'm going to add in one tablespoon of some active dry yeast, and then I will go in with a fork and just give it a quick little mix, and then I will let it sit for five minutes to activate. I'm pretty sure this is where I messed up last time I overheated my milk which killed my yeast so if you don't see that your yeast is getting nice and bubbly like this right here you need to dump it out and start over don't make the same mistake I did this was a couple years ago but I remember it completely ruined my day. But anyways, now I'm going to start adding in my flour. This is just some all-purpose flour and I'm adding in three and a half cups. As you can see, I'm trying to be very accurate with the measurements. I'm using a butter knife to level it off and I'm also going to add in one teaspoon of sea salt. I've got my dough hook attachment on my mixer and I'm going to start by slowly mixing it 
that way the flour doesn't like fly everywhere but once it starts getting incorporated i'll bump it up to a medium speed and you're just looking for it to form a ball and to clean the side so i could tell at this point that it needed some more flour you can just tell by looking at it so you're just going to get a half a cup of measurement. You don't want to add any more than four cups of flour to this recipe, no matter what. And I only ended up needing a quarter cup more. So I didn't need that full amount. Um, again, you'll just know by the way it looks. As you can see, it's formed a good ball here. It's not too sticky to the touch and the bowl on the sides is clean. So once it reached that point, I just let it knead for five minutes and then I took it out and put it into a old bowl. I just put a little bit of olive oil in that bowl and with my clean hands, I just kind of spread it around the bowl, put that dough in there and I'm just rolling it around that way that every inch of the dough is old. Then I'm going to take a damp paper towel or you can do a damp dishcloth and I'm just going to cover the bowl and let it rest for 15 minutes. Next, I'm going to grab my 9 by 13 casserole dish and spray it with some Pam, set that to the side, and then I'm going to punch down my dough and just simply plop that out onto my countertop. I'm going to go in with my hands and I'm going to form this into kind of like a rectangle and here I'm just trying to decide how I'm going to get this cut into 15 sections. So I just made two lines going long ways. Um, I'm being very careful and slow with it because I did not want to slice up my countertops. I should have transferred it to a cutting board but I don't know. I guess I just wasn't thinking. But then I went down and did four rows going down and then I went back around and you know cut it better so that I could get everything you know, actually separated. So now I'm just going to get these rolled into a ball. I just kind of took each corner of the dough and kind of pinched it to the middle and just took my hands to form it into a ball. It does not have to be perfect, but I got all of those transferred to that grease casserole dish and I covered them with that same damp paper towel and I let them rest for a final 15 minutes to let those rise. And these are going to go in a 400 degree oven for 15 minutes. You're just looking for the tops to get golden brown. And then lastly, I just melted some butter over the tops with my silicone brush and that's it i just let those cool down on a cooling rack once they were completely cooled down i covered these up and then we just reheated them when everything was ready for dinner but i love making homemade rolls because it always gives me such a sense of accomplishment it's a really good feeling and it's one of my kids favorite things and i just love seeing how happy it makes them i was trying to be aesthetic here and show y'all like the texture of it but they were so hot i could not hang on to them Next up, I am making a pepper jack potato casserole. This one was new to us and it is so amazing. It's similar to a hash brown casserole, but it's different in many ways. So you need one bag of frozen hash browns. The Orida ones truly are my favorite. To that, I'm going to add in one can of cream of chicken soup. I'm also going to grab a block of pepper jack cheese. This is just an eight ounce block and I'm going to quickly shred that up and dump all of that into the bowl. This has heavy cream, I swear, is the key ingredient. This made the casserole so creamy and it just changed the texture of it. You need a one and a half cups for the recipe and I am going to be doing that in every hash brown casserole I make from now on. I know it'll add a lot of calories, but I don't care. It is worth it. I also added in a half a cup of sour cream, a quarter cup of just the bottled Parmesan cheese, and then I went in and seasoned everything well with some onion and garlic powder, salt, and plenty of black pepper. I'm also going to add in one stick of melted butter. I did unsalted, but I'm pretty sure any version would be just fine in this. And I'm just going to stir everything together. This took a little bit of time. Off camera, I did get a big wooden spoon to stir everything and that made it a whole lot easier. But once I got it mixed good, I greased my 9 by 13 casserole dish and I just got everything dumped on out and I'm just distributing that well throughout the dish and taking the back of my spoon and spreading that out evenly. Now we're going to get started on the topping. You need one sleeve of crushed Ritz crackers. These were the half sleeves, so that's why you saw me have two. And I added three quarters of a cup of Parmesan cheese to it and a good sprinkle of paprika. I sealed the bag and gave it a good shake. And then I'm just layering that evenly over the top of the casserole. The recipe does call for some cooked and crumbled bacon to be added to the Ritz topping. And I know that that would be really good. But with everything I had to cook, I left that out. I baked 
baked it at 400 degrees for 45 minutes. It made my whole house smell so good. I'm going to cut into it for y'all. I am telling y'all, this is amazing. Definitely a new family favorite. And the leftovers reheated were just as good. I highly, highly recommend this one. Y'all have been telling me for years to try bacon wrapped asparagus, so I finally did it. I chopped off the woody ends and discarded that. I went and washed my asparagus really good, and then I just laid it out on a tin full lined cookie sheet. I melted down some of that garlic parmesan basil butter, and with my silicone brush, I'm just evenly spreading that all over the top of the asparagus. I grabbed my package of bacon, and I did not know that this Jimmy Dean bacon is like natural naturally thick cut. It didn't say thick cut on the package, so I just kind of missed that. I do think this would have been even better if it was like a regular cut bacon. I'm just, I'm not a huge fan of thick cut bacon anymore. But anyways, I started by taking three pieces of asparagus and wrapping a slice of bacon around it. But as time went on, I ended up grabbing bigger bundles of asparagus simply just because I was running out of bacon. But I got that down on there, seam side down, kind of rearranged it a little bit. And these went in the oven at 425 degrees. It'll take anywhere from 20 to 25 minutes. And you just want to flip it halfway through. When they were done, I took them out and seasoned them with some salt and pepper, and I just took a little bit of shredded Parmesan cheese and sprinkled it over each one and then transferred it to a serving platter. I can see why these are so popular. I love the way they turn out. I love the smokiness that bacon gives the asparagus, and they were truly delicious. Next, I'm going to be sharing my favorite crock pot version of macaroni and cheese. This is so good. I boiled up eight ounces of elbow macaroni needles, drained those off, and threw them in my crock pot. I threw in two tablespoons of butter, and I'm just kind of gently stirring that into the noodles, letting them get to know each other. That way, it can kind of start to melt down. I'm also drizzling in a little bit of olive oil, and I'm just going to continue stirring basically until the butter melts. Then I'm going to add in this 12-ounce can of evaporated milk. I'm also going to do two cups of some shredded sharp cheddar cheese. This is just the bag cheese, and it's always worked really well in this recipe, so that saves some time. I love of that. I'm also adding in a cup of milk. I'm just using 2%, but you can totally use whatever you have on hand. And then it calls for a cup of some diced Velveeta cheese. I'm technically using the great value version of Velveeta cheese, but it's perfect in macaroni and cheese recipes. It melts so good and I think it's an important ingredient. So I'm going to dump that on in there and I'm going to do a teaspoon of salt and I'm just going to give it a quick stir. Doesn't have to be perfect. I basically just want all that cheese to kind of be moistened by all the milks in there and I'm kind of trying to get all the loose cheese off the side so they don't burn. I'm going to add my lid to this and I'm going to let it cook on low for two hours coming in halfway to stir it. That's all there is to it. It's super easy. I've made this so many times. It's always a favorite and my favorite thing about it is it does not dry out even a few days later. If you reheat this, it is still going to be creamy. It is the perfect crock pot macaroni and cheese. Lastly, I'm going to show y'all how to make the best Easter ham, and I promise y'all it is not hard. I got an amazing deal on this spiral ham. I got it for $8.02, and it was originally over $31, so I feel like I hit the jackpot. Um, I let this sit out to room temperature before cooking, let it sit out for about two hours before transferring it to my roasting pan, and then I'm going to start making the glaze. So it's a half a cup of apricot preserves, a quarter cup of brown sugar, a a quarter cup of Dijon mustard and a quarter cup of honey and three tablespoons of butter. I have this on about a medium heat and I'm just stirring that together real good and waiting for it to come up to a simmer and once it reaches a simmer I let it cook for about a minute stirring the whole time. So I'm going to take about a third of this glaze and I'm going to brush it all over the ham. Now I made lots of cuts while editing this because I'm not going to make y'all sit there forever watching me glaze this ham just know that I glazed it very well and I am going to cover it tightly with some tin foil. This was a little bit tricky since it was so tall. You do always want to cook it cut side down. So 
I did my best. Took me a little bit. I had to use two big pieces of foil. And once I was happy with it, I placed it in my 325 degree oven. For a rule of thumb, you want to cook it for about 10 minutes per pound. Mine was nine pounds. So I cooked it for 90 minutes before removing and discarding that tin foil. So now I have bumped my oven up to 425 degrees. I've added about another third of that glaze all over the ham. I'm brushing it all around the surface. And then I popped it in the oven for 10 minutes, pulled it out, and I'm going to repeat that step just one more time. So this time I'm going to use the rest of my glaze, brushing it all around, and that's going to go back in the oven for a final 10 minutes. And then you definitely want to let it rest anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes before serving. But I transferred it on over to a serving plate. I think that it is beautiful. I absolutely love the way that it turned out. All of the pan drippings from that pan I put into my fat separator back there. That way with like each individual serving, we could pour some of that flavorful sauce over it, making it like extra juicy and just really the special touch to it. I was just so proud of this. There was plenty to give away and plenty to freeze for other meals and it was finally time to eat. This was a full day of cooking. It was definitely a labor of love but family will always be worth it and these little traditions they mean everything to me. So I truly hope you all enjoyed the video. I hope that it was helpful. I want to thank you all so much for watching and I hope that each and every one of y'all have an amazing Easter.